We are sitting here with comrade, brother, Sanyika Shakur of the August 3rd Collective, a conscious citizen of the Republic of New Africa, and a recently released survivor of Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit. We are conducting this interview on behalf of the comrades at Kerswebedev Book Publishing and Distribution. Welcome, Sanyika. Thank you, Sante. Now let's get into uh, some of the questions here. During your time in prison as a young man, you wrote your best-selling book, Monster, autobiography of an L.A. gang member. You were released, and then several years later, in 2007, your name was put on the LAPD's list of the 10 most wanted gang members, and you ended up back at Pelican Bay. So can you tell us what happened? Well, um, first and foremost, I'd like to send a, um, you know, a clinch fist salute to the comrades at Chris Flebedev for taking the time out to interview me and um, all the comrades in the struggle. Close across the planet, you know, fighting against imperialism is not terrorism. Uh, the situation with me and LAPD has always been antagonistic. Um, it's been, um, when, I, when I was a criminal, it was antagonistic, but more so be, when I became political. And um, after I wrote uh, Monster 93, um, the situation became antagonistically political in the sense that they saw that, and not just LAPD, but just pigs, period, reactionaries, they felt, um, and, and rightfully so, that I had made a transition, that I had turned a corner and became more so of a threat than I ever could be as a criminal. Uh, so as a consequence of that awareness on their behalf, they uh, intensified their effort to destroy me. Um, they, they did that in various ways by engaging me um, several times in attempts to murder me, no doubt about that. Uh, you know, I've always been resilient, and so I've struggled against that, and I've always um, been up until this point victorious. What happened in uh, 2006 actually was when um, the situation happened. Um, without going into detail, as a consequence of my parole, I'm sure they'd try to violate me if I went into details because um, the whole thing is political, and while I uh, would like to expound on it as much as I could, I can say this. <clears throat> um, an individual was sent towards me and um, with uh, an offer to uh, buy a car. The car was purchased. <clears throat> Six months later, he reported the car stolen as a consequence of him bringing the police into our deals. <clears throat> He was disciplined for making a transition, making a transgression by inviting pigs into our um, <clears throat> personal dealings. He was disciplined <clears throat> as opposed to him accepting his discipline. He ran to the American uh, security forces and, um, and said that um, I had taken the car from him and, um, and, and, and in fact had beat him, um, needing no prompting. LAPD, the reactionary pigs that they are, went right into motion. They said that I carjacked, they charged me with carjacking. <clears throat> um, they said I, I, that it was burglary because I took him into a dwelling where he was um, disciplined. They said um, that I created, that, I, um, that he suffered great bodily injury as a consequence of a broken um, eye socket. And uh, they said I robbed him though nothing was supposed, supposedly taken but the car. Immediately, I went on a, a FBI, LAPD task force, 10 most wanted gang members. And now they haven't registered me as a gang member in over 20 years. But this is the list that they already had compiled. So they just put me up there on the list as a consequence of who I am. It was just, I was a target of opportunity. Uh, and there began the hunt, $50,000 reward for just not my conviction, but my capture. So it didn't take long for the informants to lead them to me. I was I was captured um, in, on March 7th, 2007 in South Central. And um, 
I um I got eight six years with 85 percent. That was the plea bargain. I had to plead to um, carjacking as a consequence of the individuals who were captured in the car, not myself. Two other individuals said that I gave them the car. So, um, as a consequence of having an indeterminate shoe, which means that I'm saddled with a validation, that means that I've been deemed a threat to the institutional security of, of the California Department of Corrections. So they keep me in the hole. I was saddled with that in 1989. This is how I ended up back in Pelican Bay. But this 2007 wasn't just the only time I had been back in Pelican Bay. I initially got out of Pelican Bay in 1995 after having written Monster in um, 93. I was recaptured in 96 uh, for a brawl with three parole agents, which I won. Um, I was captured in 97 for going to New York without permission. I was given a 90 day violation. I was recaptured again in um, 98 for um, two attempted murders on the LAPD, two assault with deadly weapons on the LAPD. They attacked me, I won, they filed charges. Um, 2001, I was recaptured. It's been a series of captures, hunts, consequences, clashes, collisions with me and uh, the U.S. law enforcement as a consequence of my just steadfast refusal to bow down, you know, just, just, so, so it, it's, it's, you know, uh, objectively the situation is with me and these pigs is political and politics is war with bloodshed and war, I mean, excuse me, politics is war without bloodshed. And wars, politics with bloodshed. It's all politics. That's what you know. The situation really is, you know, me and these pigs, you know, because I haven't committed a criminal act against a working class person since I was a member of a street organization. Since I've been a member of the New African Independence Movement, a conscious citizen of the Republic of New Africa, I've committed no transgressions against any proletarian any working class person, student, or elder. So that's pretty much the situation with that. Now, Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit, which is also known as the SHU, uh, it has been described by prisoners and outside observers alike as a torture unit, where prisoners are subjected to long-term isolation. Could you describe life in the SHU? You know, um, it's it's stark. It's stark. It's a uh, it's quiet. It's sterile. It's a uh, concrete. It's cold. It's um. It's without question the end of the line, and and they make no qualms about that being what it is. It is actually what it is. It's the end of the line. And so uh, it's a two tier situation, a bottom tier with four cells on it, a top tier with four cells on it. The four cells uh, are about eight by 10, two concrete bunks, uh, stainless steel toilet and sink combination, and that's it. Uh, makeshift desk, but it's not, it's not practical for writing. Uh, very thin mattress. You get two blankets, you get two jumpsuits, you get four pair of socks, two t-shirts, two boxers, one pair of shoes. You can have 10 books or you can have 10 magazines. You can have five books or five magazines. You can have one ink pen filler, not an ink pen, an ink pen filler. And you have to wrap paper around the ink pen filler in order to write. You can spend um, up to now $55 a month at the canteen once a month, but they take everything out of the bags and put it in brown paper bags, consequence of what they call security. Pelican Bay, uh, it's torture in, in so much as the isolation is permanent. Uh, 
we used to be allowed to have cellies in the early 90s when I first got there. I first got there in 1990, February 1990. Um, we were allowed to have cellies beginning in April. Though um, conditions of the of the, the camp drove prisoners to the point where they felt in 97, 98, 99, uh, that there, there had to be a cleaning of house. So I think uh, 11 to 12 people were killed by the, by the cellies and um, that stopped the cell, uh, the cell uh, mates, which then drove us further into isolation and uh, solitary because when you're in a cell with someone, uh, you, 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 you tend to have human contact. You can talk to someone quietly. You can, you can exchange ideas, but as a consequence of the murders, um, which it are were a consequence of the conditions, it, we were driven further into isolation uh, by having uh, and being um, uh, put in, in solitary situations. So, you know, uh, Pe Pelican Bay is um, it's their answer to prison unity. It's their answer to prison legality is their answer to prison reform. It's their answer to uh, an alternative power source. It's their answer to revolutionary consciousness. And so 12 years before they opened up Guantanamo Bay, they opened up Pelican Bay. And it's, 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 that shouldn't be lost on anyone. Uh, it is torture. It's torture in so much as um, there, there's no vocational technical training no very little religious um, um, activity sponsored by the state or any outside um, group uh, there's um it, it, it's just a long continuum of nothing the food is the same every day we get no salt we get no pepper we get no sugar they cut the tops of, tops of our cakes off we just get the spongy bottom we get the same um, lunch every day. The water is lukewarm. We shower every other day if there's no lockdown. We can go to, to the little makeshift yard every day for 90 minutes if you please, but it's just another cell, except there's a uh, there's no roof, but there's a steel grate and a plastic top on top of that, and then a camera sticking through. You get no recreational equipment. Um, you just left there to vegetate. And if you have no means to support yourself by, you know, an adequate library or comrades as with uh, Curse Flevedev or Spear and Shield or uh, PM or uh, AK Press, if, 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 if these comrades weren't sending in material to us, more of us would have vegetated because Pelican Bay is bent on the breaking, the mind warping, and the rebuilding of prisoners in the image to which CDC deems appropriate. So it's a torture chamber, no doubt. You know, it's designed to break us down and then rebuild us in an image that's conducive to penological progress, which of course means in our language, oppression. Okay, now this is a three-part question here. What kind of prisoners end up in the shoe? How do people cope? And do you have any advice for comrades who may be looking at time in isolation? Well, Pelican Bay is primarily, uh, well, first of all, let me say this. There are no gangs in Pelican Bay shoe. The, the, and that's a tricky euphemism. That's a it's a it's a it's a it's semantics that CDC uses. While prisoners at Pelican Bay did or have on the street belong to street organizations, gangs. Once people become permanent prisoners or long term prisoners in any level four or level three setting. The gang situations cease to exist. And then now 
it becomes organizational activity. And the consequence of organizational activity creates an alternative power source that CDC does not want to exist. So what they do is they, uh, they create language that substantiates criminal, criminal activity. And then the response to criminal activity is to isolate these individuals under the euphemism of their gang members, their members of prison gangs or their associates of prison gangs. And so these words, prison and gang tend to, you know, their reaction words, their words designed to, to uh, get a reaction. And, 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 and then the public says, well, that's all they're putting in, in these places are prison gang members that they haven't learned their lesson on the street. Now they're even in prison being gangs. And that's not the case. Who ends up in Pelican Bay are, first and foremost, those who have decided consciously to go another way, away from the established system, to try to eradicate that system and to rebuild. So what I'm saying, revolutionaries end up there. Prisoners with social consciousness end up there. Jailhouse lawyers, those who help other prisoners with litigation to appeal their sentences, they end up there. Uh, you know, an interesting thing about Pelican Bay is you can kill a, a, another prisoner in general population. And the max you can get in the hole is five years, 60 months. You, you, you can kill another prisoner, take his or her life and end up with 60 months in the hole. But if you get caught with one of George Jackson's books or some Swahili or some Nawa or something by Magon or Che, or if you uh, have a, a certain tattoo, a dragon, a star, two bars, three dots, uh, if you uh, if you show any sign of resistance, you will end up in Pelican Bay. What they'll give you is what they'll say is that you are a threat to the institutional security. Now here, now interestingly enough, about that is on August 11th, I was still a threat to the institutional security, so I couldn't go out to the main population, the general population, with other prisoners. I was deemed a threat to other prisoners and staff. And yet on August 12th, Black August, I was standing in Home Depot, surrounded by civilians, that they let me out onto the street, but they wouldn't let me around other criminals. And, and so the, the contradiction of that, it blows in the face of their whole security trip. Uh, you know, uh, The prison industrial complex is a racket. It's a racket. It's just another big business venture sponsored by, for and to the advantage of capitalism. And prisons are designed, especially for uh, uh, citizens of internal nations, uh, as genocidal uh, stockades. So the people who end up in Pelican Bay are those who resist, those who uh, have shown a distinct effort to uh, revolutionize the consciousness of other prisoners, those who uh, demonstrate uh, legal uh, uh, acumen, uh, and you get you you get a few people in there for a few stabbings, you know, here and there and all that. But Pelican Bay and Corcoran State Prison are designed to break political people. And politics are any relations between people centered on the seizure and retention of state power. So politics are vast. That's what Pelican Bay does. What was the second question? Uh, how, Excuse me. how do people cope in the shoe? Well, everybody can. And, and people um, retreat into madness continuously. Uh, you know, we hear it over the tears a lot. 
as a consequence of the Madrid ruling, though, which uh, excluded prisoners who already have uh, psych psychotic uh, situations. You see what they would use. What they used to do in the early uh, '90s is they would just throw anybody in there, and so prisoners who already had uh, a history of a uh, psychosis or um, had uh, mild situations of uh, schizophrenia or paranoia, they would immediately fall all the way off. They would begin to run, rub feces on themselves, throw urine, antagonize other prisoners. Well, as a consequence of uh, the Madrid ruling, uh, uh, where, where Judge uh, Tilton of, the, of San Francisco said that Pelican Bay was indeed cruel and unusual punishment, but yet the prison population was so vast and the people in Pelican Bay were so few that at the expense of these few to save the rest of these people, we can keep them in there. However, those with psychological problems, they put them in PSU, Psychological Service Unit. Uh, that relieved the pressure on other prisoners from uh, the clashes that would occur as a consequence of this particular individual uh, going off, losing his, his mind. Uh, the, the coping mechanisms that I used in Pelican Bay were study and struggle, a constant repetition of study and struggle. And I, what I mean by that is not just reading, but study. Reading, consuming, meditating, thinking. Once you get to that stage, then you begin to struggle around the issues, whether they're uh, how do we implement a socialist system? How do we bring back a uh, 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 sister and brotherhood? How do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, formulate a people's army? You know, these are issues that we have to implement as a consequence of our study and struggle, study. And so uh, that was my particular coping mechanism. My thing was that I knew that they were trying to break me. And so that that gave me a determination to not be broken, which then uh, led me to reach out. And I, I, you know, I, I reached out to other comrades and not just in the New African Independence Movement, but I went to Canada. You know, I went to New York. I went to Germany. I went to uh, Ireland. I, you know, I, I started reaching out to revolutionaries on, across the planet, and they in turn responded and began to support the efforts that they saw me engaged in, which was study and struggle. So my thing was, uh, with the, with the aid of Kurt Splevedev, PM, AK Press, Spear and Shield. Uh, San Francisco Bayview was to bear down and use what I learned to try to aid someone else from falling into the traps that I had fallen into and more so getting up out of that trap, breaking loose and correcting the person that made the trap. So all that is interconnected. So the coping mechanisms are are various. Each individual has his or her own ways of dealing with it. You know, I exercise. Uh, I, I walk continuously up and down the cell. Uh, I meditate, like I said. I study. I struggle. I write. Uh, I stay in communication with people, so I try to have a constant stream of letters coming in and going out. And um, to try to let people know that, that although I'm buried alive, I, I'm still I'm still struggling, you know. So the, my coping mechanism was, was was socializing as much as I could. Okay. In 2011, prisoners in the SHU organized a hunger strike against their conditions and against the gang validation policies, which eventually rallied support in prisoners throughout California, with over 6,000 prisoners refusing food. How did the strike go down in Pelican Bay? Uh, July 1st, the, the word had came down uh, from the comrades in the short corridor uh, that um, we should begin to uh, implement ways in which to roll back 
the draconian issue of our gang validation. Uh, again, uh, just to speak personally, uh, in 1989, September, uh, I was given uh, my final point. It takes three points to be uh, given what's called indeterminate or to be validated. So my, I got my third point in 1989. They said I had written a letter with revolutionary overtones. And um, that landed me in Ad Seg and Solidad. I was there on a violation. And um, that point landed me in Ad Seg. When, when I got to Ad Seg, they had a, a situation, uh, a group of people there, there called CAC, Criminal Activities Coordinator which is IGI, and um, they went through their investigation. They said, uh, in 1988, I was uh, observed exercising in military fashion with uh, known revolutionaries in Folsom Prison. Uh, and then in 1987, they said, while in San Quentin, um, I received some writings of uh, Comrade George Jackson. As someone had sent me through the mails, I never got, they intercepted and never said they intercepted them, nor did they say they had taken pictures of me and these revolutionaries exercising in Folsom in 88. Well, in 89, when I came back and they had started the new Pelican Bay validation program, I already had two points. So when they said I had written a letter with revolutionary overtones in 89, that was my third and final point. That in effect gave me life in the hole. And so from 89, September forward, I've been in um, both Ad Segs and Pelican Bay. I, I went through Corcoran twice, once in 90, uh, I stayed there six months, and again in, uh, no, 91, I stayed there six months on, on a layover waiting to go back to Pelican Bay during the height of the cockfights, you know, the, the staged fights between prisoners that the pigs would set up. I, I went back through there in uh, 90, no, 2000, 99, 2000 for another six month stay and um, then back to Pelican Bay. Um, the hunger strike was, uh, well, it was built around five core demands. And um, those five core demands are, uh, you know, us, the valid gang validation, uh, people who debrief, uh, you know, a fair and partial hearing an investigation. Well, these five demands came down from the comrades on the short side. And um, those of us on both long sides, actually there's three long sides and one short side. And the short corridor means that there's just four buildings on one corridor, four blocks, uh, one through four. That's what's called the short corridor. And then on the other hallway of D facility, there's a uh, five through 10. On the C facility side, there's 12 blocks, one through six on one corridor and uh, seven through 12 on the other corridor. So these three are called long corridors and then there's a short corridor. The short corridor is designed for people who have been, um, who have life, who are validated and are considered uh, <clears throat> a cadre, people who are, are um, uh, avowedly active and, and obviously can't be broken and have been um, at the height and the top of the game of struggle since their imprisonment. Well, we, we got the word and um, so, yeah, we, we were with it because by that time we had been the whole 20 years and um, for nothing. Well, you know, our, our point had been all along that had we earned our way into this hole, had I stabbed or or knock down a couple pigs, you know what I mean? Or, or had I uh, uh, corrected a rapist or corrected a child molester or an informant, I would have sat there quietly because I had earned my way in there. But you gonna give me life in the hole because you said I exercised with revolutionaries because I wrote a letter that you say had revolutionary overtones and that I had writings from Comrade George Jackson that deserved me the rest of my life in a hole because now I'm a threat to the institutional security. So we overstood from the beginning, it was all politics, bourgeois politics, reactionary politics. So we got together and August 1st, we dropped it. 
And um, surprisingly to us, because we had had a hunger strike before in 2001, and uh, it wasn't really well orchestrated and it didn't come off too hot, but uh, we were determined and we doubled back. And so in uh, 2011, on uh, July 1st, we dropped it. And um, with the aid of uh, Curse Blevardale, uh San Francisco Bayview, prison, California Prison Focus, Bar None, uh, and, and, and a whole host of other revolutionary uh, and conscious and concerned people about just humans, we were able to be successful. And the first strike, as you, you mentioned, uh, was uh, 6,000 people. And then uh, CDC, of course, they were shocked because here you got these cats locked in a short corridor and then us in all these long corridors and we're still able to communicate when this is supposed to be the most maximum security prison in the country. And yet we're still able to communicate and um, organize uh, a strike, but we couldn't have done it without the outside help of concerned supporters. And um, it's just a, a beautiful thing that, that, that at, at, at that time in, in this day and age, people had said that it, it, enough is enough. Well, CDC came and said, uh, well, you know, uh, you guys are right. You know, we're gonna start uh, implementing these five core demands. In the meantime, here's a beanie, here's a coat, we, we may pull up a pull up bar, here's a couple extra items on the canteen, and we'll get around to those five core demands. And of course, by September, they hadn't gotten around to it. And they had been shucking and jiving with our principal representatives. And uh, so another hunger strike was uh, implemented. And this time we, uh, we garnished the uh, aid of 12,000 prisoners. We doubled the amount of prisoners that participated. And in 13 prisons up and down the coast of California and several within the empire and some even around the world supported us. And um, it was harsh because, you know, the first hunger strike, they were caught unprepared, the pigs. And so a lot of times they didn't come and take things that we had in our cell. But by the time the second hunger strike came around, they positioned themselves to react more swiftly. And so things, uh, you know, it was, uh, they kind of uh, responded harsh, harshly because they were embarrassed by the first one that they were caught off guard. Still, we were successful. And uh, if nothing else, it showed that even in the most downtrodden situations, you can still do something. And that's what we proved. And still today, our five core demands have not been adequately met. CDC is, has now implemented what's called a step down program, which is um, uh, just a, a change in language from calling us prison gang members to now calling us security threat group members or associates. And these things will still get you life in the hole if we ever get out. Some they can say you're a security threat group one member. Uh, uh, and so therefore you still pose such a threat to the security of the institution and others that we can't let you out. And so it's a play on words, and we're resisting that, and we don't, we don't, we're not going for that. In fact, we just, we just uh, got a circulation the other day in uh, the Rock newsletter that's um, put together and edited by our good comrade Ed Lee uh, of the George Jackson Brigade. Uh, and w well, we're we're resisting that the the step down program, the security threat group, because this is euphemistic. It's, it, you know, it's shadowy language and what they're trying to do is, in effect, you know, deem us terrorists and, you know, it's not terroristic to fight against imperialism. You know, that's that's a human right to fight against oppression. So uh, while we were proud that we had reached the amount of people that we had and we were happy that we had got the support that we had gotten, we are by no means resting on our laurels. We, you know, it's a struggle every day. And even though I'm out now, you know, um, if the comrades went on a hunger strike today, I would strike right here. I, I would not eat right here. I mean, that would just, because I am a member of the shoe class. Um, you know, that's, I, you know, uh, I, I 
I've been in prison for 25 years. 20 of those years have been in the hole. Probably 22. And three have been in general population. So I'm a I'm a permanent shoe class prisoner. You know, and so that comes with a certain amount of responsibility, consciousness, and um, obligation. When Tukey said, uh, Moto and Donnie, that's uh, why he before, the fire within. As long as you have that Moto and Donnie, that fire within, you can continue to go forward. Pelican Bay's job is to try to put that fire out. And then you have people who debrief or people who uh, lose their mind as a consequence of the pressure. We have a saying in Pelican Bay. It's either going, Pelican Bay is going to either make dust or diamonds. That's what it's, it's going to pulverize you or it's going to steal you. It's going to, it's going to sharpen you. Okay, in your most recent writings, you stress new African nationhood as opposed to a black identity. How are these different? Well, what we're trying to do now uh, in the new African independence movement, and as we should have done long ago, is get away from the usage of color, of, of color to describe uh, and denote nationality. See, because what, what happens is when you start saying, I'm black, she's white, he's yellow, she's brown, she's red. You lose the identity of the people. And now while these colors were necessary in the 60s to get away from things like engine, Negro, spick, uh, you know, uh, uh, nigga, wetback. While these words were necessary to get, get away from those uh, colonial words, they weren't sufficient. So we see now today, and we have since the 80s actually, when we reformulated the whole ideal of this black thing, is that um, black is just a color. There is no continent called black. There were no black people before 1492. They, you know, black is a consequence of colonialism. Period. Uh, and so what we try to do is get, get out of that colonial mentality by uh, properly describing who we are and what we want. When we say we are a new African people, we're saying first and foremost that we are a nation unto ourselves inside the belly of the beast, separate and distinct with our own set of contradictions. And, and not only that, but when we say we're new African, we're saying we're not black. We're not American. We don't want to be American, nor do we necessarily want to be black. We will use it interchangeably now to people who don't really understand. But we're trying to get away from that whole race thing because there really are no races. And when you say you're black and she's white and he's red and she's brown, you're saying that there's a myriad of races on the planet. And that's not the case. The situation is this. Race has been used to divide humanity. Real talk. And so if we say we're black and they're white and she's brown and he's yellow, we are going along with that false construct of race. When I can have mutual relations with her or her or her or any other female on this planet and produce a child. That means that we are of the same race, irregardless of what our nationality is, our customs, our culture, or our language, or our geographical location. We are of the same race, we're humans. What we are, however, are broken down into nationalities with customs, cultures, Ling, uh, linguistics and so on and so forth. And that's the, the reality of us stressing new African, new African, new African nation. By saying you're a new African, you're saying I am and I have a right to a nationality. If you are a nationality, you consequently come from or should be trying to get a nation. 
nationalities stem from nas nations. And so that's the whole thing about, uh, we, we, we're trying to clarify our positions uh, uh, re regarding this whole race thing. We're rejecting that whole thing about race and racism. Not saying it, it, see, the thing about racism is this. It's false and yet it's real. It's false because we know that we all can breathe procreate if we wish and yet it's real because it'll get you killed in any corner in this country you know we know that they are racist we know that there are white supremacists we know that there are black supremacists believe it or not it is what it is people get hung up on these colors and they start drifting off and not understanding that what you're doing is actually promoting your own oppression because it was that division of humanity by the, the, the ruling classes of the Western world that created the subjugations, you know. Uh, yeah, so that, that's our thing about uh, this whole color thing, you know, you know, uh, you know, we're more than a color, you know, we, we're a nationality, you know, deserving the nation. So you are a communist at a time when the world in, is in, increasingly rocked by insurrections and rebellions, but also at a time when communism is very much out of favor. Some would say that the 20th century saw communism try and fail. What do you mean by communism? I am in fact a communist. I am a new African communist. I, uh, I've been a communist since 1986. I'm a proud member of, uh, of of the communist faction of the new African independence movement. Uh, let, let me say this first and foremost. The, the so-called prototype of communism that we've been given by Russia was no communism at all. In fact, Russia was an imperialist country since the death of Lenin. And, um, but it, it, parlayed and dragged as a communist country and the West promoted that because they knew from the beginning it was authoritarian and imperialist uh, uh, state. And so they knew that they could do nothing but make communism look bad. Now, saying that, we were grateful, however, from 57, from 45 to uh the late 60s and a little after that of the weapons we were able to get in the worldwide revolution from Russia. But they only gave us enough weapons that it didn't actually threaten imperialism. And studies prove that. So when people say in 89 or 90 there was the collapse of communism, no, it was the collapse of Soviet imperialism. And so, see, see, there's only two ways to govern any economy, socialist or capitalist, period. There's only two ways. So by people saying that communism is out of disfavor or has failed, there's no country that has ever reached communism. There's, no, there's been no country that ever reached the stage. Communism is the highest form of socialism. It's the dissolution of all classes. No country, not even the great Cuba, today has reached that stage. Capitalism, however, has had such a long run and it feeds to such narcissistic and egotistical uh, human traits that it has longevity. And I gotta say it, capitalism is revolutionary. It continuously changes, it adapts, it moves, it 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 fosters the image of well-being. So but but that's just the outer shell. Communism, however, uh well, you know there is no communism. There's just communist, believe it or not, because no one has reached that stage. China since 79, actually since the death of uh, Mao Zedong in 76, has been a state capitalist government. You know, there is no communism there, of course. It's, it's, it's state crony capitalism. Uh, 
uh, me as a communist, I'm a communist in the sense that I believe in the equal distribution of wealth and privilege. I believe in um, the equality. I believe in the dictatorship of the proletariat. I'm a, I'm a working class person. Whether I got a job or not, I have a working class mentality. That means that I'm down with those who toil, those who labor, you know, uh, and not just the laborers, but students. Um, um, I, I'm down with the masses, those who uh, have the, 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 the foot of the state on their neck and, and are exploiting their labor. I'm a communist because I believe in the community. I believe in the community is more important than the individual. I'm a communist because I believe in a socialist system. You know, I am anti-capitalist. You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm not just anti-capitalist, but I'm pro-socialist. You, you know, and so uh, to, to me, to be a communist is to be in the resistance, is to be anti that which has been killing humanity since it um, evolved from feudalism as a consequence of New African colonialism. So you've written about capitalism and about colonialism. Some of your writings also deal with patriarchy, homophobia, and transphobia. How do all of these things fit together? You know, that's a good, good, good question. People are uh, becoming little oppressors unto themselves as a consequence of the oppression that has for, for, for since 1619 been stationed over our heads here. It's as a consequence of living so close to the seat of empire, so close to, to the, the beast, we begin to take on the traits of the beast and then we'll cloak it in some super duper black shit. Like this is like as if, for instance, as if homosexuality didn't exist before the Arabs and the Europeans came to Africa. As if they brought that and it's, a, I heard one dude say it's a consequence of some mental, wait, 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 I gotta say this, because this idiot, and that's what he is, this idiot, this dude, and I won't say his name because I want to talk to him personally first and then I'll get it, but this idiot is one of those super duper black dudes. And what he does is he goes around and super duper black, he goes around with this super duper black shit. And, uh, and he is trying to convince our people that first and foremost, that the white man is the devil. He's still on that crap. And yet we got old rock bottom Obama up there. But in one instance, he's saying that, that the white man is the devil. And then the next instance, to prove his point that homosexuality is a mental disease, he quotes the same white man he calls the devil in his in his uh, mental health uh, writings. So, so you know, that's a contradiction unto itself. The fact of the matter is, as revolutionaries, as oppressed people, we don't have the luxury to exclude any other oppressed person from struggling or living. Or who are we to say that as a consequence of who you sleep with or who you're attracted to, that you don't deserve freedom, that you're abnormal? That's the same stuff they used to say about us as a consequence of our skin being darker, or our noses being broader, or our hair being more curlier, or our phalluses being bigger, whatever. As a consequence of the slightest difference, the system would exclude us and use that, a la the Willie Lynch letter, to oppress us. And yet, here we come. in master's tracks, oppressing as little oppressors, other oppressed people. Martin Luther King said, don't judge someone by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Same way when it comes to this whole 
gender thing. Gender is just as made up as race. It doesn't. It's, it's, it's real and yet it's not real. I'll be damned if I exclude somebody from helping the rest of us get free or themselves get free as a consequence of who they sleep with, what they wear, what color their hair is. That, that, that. The issue is, are you down with arm stroke? Are you honest? Are you responsible? What can you contribute to the struggle? Are you with us or are you against us? That's the only issue we need to know. And I think as revolutionaries, we need to lead the struggle on uh, issues of homophobia, transphobia, uh, uh, against racism with this whole black, black thing, or white, white this. And, you know, revolutionary, the, the, what made the revolutionaries of the 60s and 70s so potent was that their theory was on the cutting edge of where we needed to go. It was so critical, it was so sharp that it was almost insane. And see, that's the, that's the beauty of correct theory. It's so far ahead that it's looked at as abnormal. So when we come out and say, we recruit gays, lesbians, transgender people, uh, bisexuals, we recruit anybody that's oppressed. The super duper black, black people look at us like, there they go. We heard one idiot say, uh, the, homo, uh, the, the, the gay movement has hijacked the civil rights movement. Civil rights ain't a black thing. Civil rights is a neo-colonial thing. Civil rights means you're trying to be a citizen of the oppressive nation. My point is, it's not about who you sleep with, when you sleep with them, what you wear when you sleep with them, what you do in the comfort of your own bedroom or wherever. It's about are you down with us or not? That's the issue. And that's the only issue our group, our movement should have with anybody. You know, um, I'm not concerned about what color your complexion is. I'm not concerned about how long your hair is. I'm not concerned about if you got on two shoes or one or high heels or flats. I'm concerned about can you do the job given to you adequately, responsibly? Can you respond to the people's needs? Can you contribute to us getting free? The beast already recognizes this. The beast already opened up its ranks. The beast said, don't ask, don't tell. Then they demolished that. So if the reactionaries are ahead of the revolutionaries, what does that say about the revolutionaries? So yeah, our, our, our thing is, you know, we get down with uh, anybody that's oppressed. Anybody that wants to fight is welcome to join the revolution. All right, this is the final question in the interview. Uh, this August, you were finally released from prison. What is it like being back on the outside after so many years in isolation? What are your conditions on the outside? Pelican Bay over the years since 89 has taken its toll on me. And I didn't really recognize it until this time when I got out that I picked up a few OCDs, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. I'm meticulous about cleaning. I have uh, anxiety issues. I can't sleep a lot of times throughout the week. Uh, I, I sleep maybe two, two, two days in a row good. And the other five days, they're up and down and ratty sleeping uh, patterns. Uh, I respond to loud sounds. I have a fear of crowds, fast moving objects, bright colors tend to disorientate me. And here it is now, uh, January 1st, and I'm just now uh, starting to uh, 
get acclimated to uh, spaces, wide open spaces. Um, I, I think I, the older I get, the more um, sensitive I become, and the sensitivity is uh, derived from a consequence of being isolated. And so the slightest touch, the slightest sound, the slightest smell, you know, it, it, it just it stimulates me to the point where I'm overstimulated and um, it, I become disoriented. It's hard to write, um, it's hard to read, to concentrate. And, it's a, and, see, and these are the things that we say about Pelican Bay as being a torture chamber. Um, and I've been out. I've never done no longer than five years. This is the longest I've ever done, which is five years and five months. But this is my third five-year term, where actually I've had seven years and done five each time, three times. And so, uh, and all in the hole, and then the violations to boot. But just think about the prisoner that hasn't been out since 89, that's just been in that one box since 89, and has not just indeterminate, but a life term. And so, you, you know, think about him or her in that situation. Uh, my conditions of parole, of course, it's all political. I was kicked out of Los Angeles County. Uh, I was dropped off in San Diego. I got an ankle bracelet on, GPS. They can see everywhere I go. I got 44 special conditions of parole. Things as small as uh, I can't hitchhike. I can't have a mask on Halloween. I can't have surveillance equipment. Um, it's, it's a myriad of just 44 special. Let me say this. When I was a criminal, I went to prison two times for shooting several people. Each time I got out for shooting several people, I had four conditions. No guns, no drugs, no gangs. Can't travel 50 miles from my pro agent. This time, a carjacking, a piece of steel that was deprived from an idiot. 44 special conditions. Aside from the four I already have. So actually it's 48. An ankle bracelet and kicked out of the county of Los Angeles. LA was fine when I was shooting people. LA was fine when I was monster coding. LA was fine when I was selling drugs, using drugs. That was all good with LA. But when you become a revolutionary, you become a threat. And not to the institutional security of a prison, but to the institution of capitalism. And that's what's really cracking. And so it is what it is. Uh, I think that if they let me out of Pelican Bay and didn't do nothing, I'd been doing something wrong. So, I, you, know, it, you know, it's the dialectical relationship. It is what it is. Uh, had to slow me down, not one bit. At the same time, I'm cautious, I'm respectful, I'm courteous, uh, I'm hopeful. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist. You know, I, you know, I, I get up every morning thinking that today's gonna be better than yesterday was. You know, why well, get up if it's, you don't think that? You know, I think that you know that we are on the right side of social development. I think that uh, if we survive, we can win. I think that one of our biggest uh, problems is that we self-defeat, that we think we can't, when obviously the beast knows we can, otherwise why would they be doing us like this? If they didn't have faith in us, and they tend to have more faith in us than we have in ourselves sometimes. If they didn't have faith in us to get free, why would they oppress us such? So, that's that, That's it, you know? And you know, in closing, I'd like to say, man, you know, shout out to Chris Clever Dale, shout out to Ed Mead, Carl, Dale, you know, the comrades of certain days, the catalog, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, calendar. If you ain't got the calendar certain days, y'all need to get that. Uh, San Francisco Bay View, California Prison Focus, all the comrades in the short corridor, Pelican Bay period, the whole shoe class. Uh, you know, shout out to all the revolutionaries. Uh, you know, Immortal Technique, Dead Press, 
Diabolic. Shout out, man. Revolutionaries, man. New African Independence Movement. Provisional Government. Republic of New Africa. August 3rd Collective. Shout out all New African political prisoners, prisoners of war. I see my free land. <laughs>